We will be sharing the recording with all participants following this, uh, the, the actual workshop. Um, and then you are also welcome to submit questions via the chat. Um, we'll monitor it throughout and we'll be pulling from those for the panel discussions as well as some of the Q&A at the end of the workshop. And if you have any technical issues, you can email myself or Sarah Fisher, um, our emails, we can put those in the chat, um, but it's sread at electrificationcoalition.org or sfisher at electrificationcoalition.org. So don't hesitate to reach out if you get kicked out or have any Zoom challenges. Um, and I just wanna thank all of you who participated in our interviews and our research um, and to Johan and his team for supporting this really important work around charging infrastructure deployment in our communities. And um, I'm excited to talk to all of you today. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Johan. Thank you so much. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. And thanks, Sarah, for, uh, for kicking things off today in this very important workshop. So my name is Johan Zyman, and I'm a Trade and Investment Officer for the UK Department for International Trade based at the British Consulate General in Houston, Texas. And I really am really pleased to, to welcome everybody here today to participate in this workshop on a very important topic dealing with the equitable rollout of EV charging infrastructure. So over the last few months, the British Embassy in Washington, DC and the Electrification Coalition, we've been working together to sort of map out the challenges and some of the opportunities for equitable EV charging infrastructure faced by many of the US cities, some of whom are now in today's workshop. So today, the Electrification Coalition will, shortly after I finish talking and after uh, some welcoming remarks from Canal, our Deputy Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for the United States, the Electrification Coalition will give a sort of a brief recap in terms of the findings that they undertook and found in their research. Then we're going to have two UK organizations, the Energy Systems Catapult and the Association for Renewable Energy and Clean Technology. And they're going to talk a little bit about their experiences in terms of expanding EV charging within the UK. We will then have two panel sessions that will now dive a little deeper into some of the findings that the Electrification Coalition uh, found in their research. And we're gonna be hearing from four US cities and then also from four UK companies. And they will then be sharing ideas, their experiences, learnings, best practices on the deployment of EV charging infrastructure, especially as it pertains to disadvantaged communities. And then the workshop will conclude with a Q&A session for about 15 to 20 minutes. So, ladies and gentlemen, the UK really has been a global front runner in adopting a whole systems approach in analyzing the most appropriate solution for EV charging networks. And I'm really looking forward for an informed discussion today on how the US and the UK can collaborate further to make EV charging infrastructure more accessible to disadvantaged communities. So at this time, I'd like to then turn it over to Canal Khatri to make some welcome remarks. Canal is the Deputy Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for the United States. He's based at the Consulate General in New York, and he's standing in for Emma Wade Smith, who unfortunately is not able to join us today. So let me turn it over to Canal. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and I'm delighted to be with you here today virtually. And Emma sends her apologies. I know she would have loved to have joined you. So Johan's given the introduction uh, in terms of who I am. I'm normally based in New York, but here in DC today, and I've been hearing all about this uh, EV workshop. So I think this is going to be fantastic. Just a bit of background of who we are, the Department of International Trade. So we're an organization across the US, uh, Johan and his team in Houston, but in all you know, eight cities across the US. And our, our day job is to help UK companies into the US market, US companies into the UK market. But there's a policy wrapper around all of that. And how do we collaborate public private sector to deliver some of our ambitions? 
Two of our top ambitions are supporting the UK and US economies to transition to net zero. And the other one is actually how do you ensure an equitable economic recovery in both the US and the UK? Build back better here, leveling up in the UK, it's the same objective. So this workshop is perfect. It brings it all together in one, and it does do still see through that lens of equitable EV charging infrastructure. So I think this is a great workshop and it hits, you know, all our mutual objectives and targets as well. The, the bottom line, the, the, why is this important? And it's because we are now thankfully coming out of the tail of the pandemic, but we face an enormous challenge on what an equitable economic recovery looks like. And actually that economic recovery has to be based on a strong foundation of a sustainable and environmentally sustainable economy. That requires decarbonizing transport, improving air quality, reducing greenhouse grasses. It's gotta be a green recovery, but it's gotta be an equitable recovery as well. In the UK, we have set out our plans for how that is gonna be through what we call our 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. That was announced in November, 2020. And a year later here in the US, the Congress passed the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act. And both of those will comprehensively define and shape what our economies look like for decades to come. Both of those plans have EV charging infrastructure as a core pillar of the economic recovery. Um, for the UK, what that means from 2030 onwards, there'll be no further sale of gasoline and diesel cars and vans. That's from 2030 onwards, which is 10 years earlier than originally planned. We're also investing 1.7 billion to accelerate the rollout of charging infrastructure. And there is a dedicated 550 million pot, which is focused on how do you actually diversify public access and the public rollout of that EV charging infrastructure as well. Here in the US, the mirror image is that the Investment and Jobs Act creates a fund of 7.5 billion to roll out 500,000 EV chargers and infrastructure across the US. And again, 2.5 billion of that is dedicated to increasing the access to that infrastructure in disadvantaged communities. So there are mirror images here, there are complementarities, there is areas that we can both learn off each other. Both of these missions and both of these agendas are gonna be critical to catalyzing new growth, to revitalizing disadvantaged communities, laying the foundations for our economies for decades to come. And I think it's fantastic today in today's workshop, we're gonna hear from four US cities, Dallas, Charlotte, Baltimore, and Phoenix, about your experiences and how you have tried to lead this recovery and equitable recovery, including through charging infrastructure. And at the same time, we're gonna hear from six UK companies and organizations, those who have been involved in rolling out this EV infrastructure in the UK and the US, and have been working with local authorities to do it because this has got to be public and private. This cannot just be done by one side alone. So look, in closing, I wanna say a huge thank you to the Electric Electrification Coalition uh, for working with us, the Department of International Trade to pull this together. Um, I wanna say a special thanks to the US cities joining us today and then the UK companies and organizations as well. It'll be a fascinating discussion, but I also hope that this is the start of collaboration and that from this, you take away new ideas and new partnerships. And I look forward to working with you all to see how we can drive deeper UK and US collaboration around EV charging infrastructure rollout. So I wish you a very productive day and workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Canal, for those welcoming remarks. So uh, let's kick off the uh, the next uh, section of the of the workshop, and this is where we're going to hear from the Electrification Coalition to talk a little bit about uh, their findings, which they did over about a, a two three month period. So let me hand over to Sarah Fisher, that's uh, who's going to now give us a, a quick recap. Go ahead, Sarah. Yes, thank you, Johan. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Right, so can everyone see these slides? Yes. Perfect. So thank you again, everyone, for joining our workshop this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to share some information about the Electrification Coalition, as well as review some of the findings um, that we learned in our interviews with cities on this subject. So first, I just wanna highlight some of the EC team members we have on the call today. 
Katie Robinson is our VP of Programs, and Sarah Reed is one of our senior program managers. You'll hear more from Sarah Reed during the panel session shortly. My name is Sarah Fisher, and I'm an electric vehicle specialist at the EC. I sit on the programs team, and my main role is to help provide technical support for public fleets like cities that are trying to go electric. So some quick background on the EC. We are a nonprofit that works across the country. We have an office in DC. So we have a small contingency of folks that live and work there, but the vast majority of our staff is remote and spread out across many different states. I'm currently living in Seattle and Sarah Reed, who you'll hear from later is in Sacramento. The EC was founded in 2008 as a spinoff of our sister organization, Securing America's Future Energy, or SAFE. And we come at transportation electrification with a goal to highlight the national security and economic benefits that it can provide in addition to the environmental and public health benefits. So this is something that has been especially relevant in the past few weeks with current global events. So if anyone would like to have deeper conversations about that, please do reach out to Sarah Reed or I. All right, so now on to the reason we're here today. Under Johan's guidance, Sarah Reed and I conducted interviews with city staff in 17 cities across the country, including the four cities that will be featured in our panel discussions today. In these interviews, it was really our goal to understand the city's perspectives on EV charging infrastructure, what work they had done in this space, and if they had taken equity into account in any of those projects. We also asked questions to identify what were some of the challenges that they had faced or perceived and what kind of support would alleviate some of those hurdles. So in these conversations, there were a number of topics that were mentioned by multiple city stakeholders. Unsurprisingly, budget and cost concerns were among the most often cited, but we did also notice a few other recurring themes. One major theme was that either city staff or community stakeholders preferred for the city to focus on alternative transportation projects like transit, walkability or bikeability, some of which we defined as other forms of e-mobility aside from just single occupancy EVs. Many of the city staff emphasized that they wanted to integrate equity into the EV work that they were hoping to do, but they weren't sure how and didn't want to move forward approaching it incorrectly. So in that vein, it was, it was referenced a lot that city staff would need clear community feedback or buy-in to move forward. So based on these interviews, the team was able to pull out several major challenges and potential solutions. And this is the table that is in the program that everyone received yesterday. So the main, the main categories were budget constraints, challenges in equitable planning and conflicting transportation priorities. For this workshop, we decided to focus on the first two to encourage a deeper dialogue on these challenges and potential opportunities for collaboration. So to dive a little more in depth on budgetary constraints, these are some of the things that we noted. Many municipalities lacked the budget for public infrastructure projects, or even if they had received a grant to cover a portion, they were unable to raise matching funds. Many of the cities we spoke with were dependent on those state or federal funds to build charging infrastructure, and there had been limited funding or bureaucratic roadblocks in receiving specific funding in the past. Several cities mentioned that trenching and conduit costs associated with the installations were often what made them cost prohibitive, especially considering that many city buildings were older and might have had limited existing electrical capacity. And finally, most cities who had success in deploying a number of public charging stations have benefited from some kind of utility support. So some of the potential areas for collaboration that we identified and hope to discuss today are grant application support, technology applications that reduce cost, such as pole mounting charging stations on existing utility poles. 
The second topic we're hoping to cover today is staff capacity and community engagement. So in this vein, many cities reported insufficient data or a lack of access to tools to determine what the equity needs of their communities were. Several cities wanted to gather that community feedback but weren't sure where to start or lacked the staff capacity to spend significant time deeply engaging and communicating with stakeholders. Fears of gentrification were also cited multiple times, and that's often what led cities to not moving forward if they didn't have access to the tools and capacity they needed to engage with communities. So solutions to these challenges were often cases where external organizations were able to come in and work with cities to provide access to those tools and needs assessment data or provide increased staff capacity to have those conversations deeply with community members. So today, those are the two areas we want to dive into. And these are the stakeholders speaking in each of those panel sessions. We have City of Phoenix, City of Dallas, Arup, Connected Curb, City of Baltimore, City of Charlotte, City EV, and Wood. That's all I have. I'll add in that I'll be providing tech support and monitoring the chat throughout the workshop today. So please do feel free to send any questions you have. And now I will go ahead and pass it back to Johan. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that recap of the um, of the report's findings. Um, we can share the slides with everybody afterwards. And also, if those interested, we have put together about a four page uh, summary of the report that we can uh, share with uh, participants today as well. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, and um, she is Thalia Schofer. She is from the Energy Systems Catapult. So that is one of the UK organizations that um, you're going to be hearing a little bit more today, ladies and gentlemen, about some of the work they've been doing in terms of expanding um, EV charging infrastructure within the UK, some of the, the companies that they've worked with, and uh, really looking forward to hearing what Thalia has to say. So Thalia, the floor is yours. Hey, Thalia, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. I, I couldn't unmute No myself. problem. Hopefully, apologies for that. Hopefully, you can see my screen OK. Um, yes, yes, we can. Um, thank you. I'm Thalia Skufa from the Energy Systems Catapult, and I'm leading our practice, transport practice capability, um, which includes our transport related projects at both national and local levels, uh, but also our transport related uh, modeling capability. I'm going to start with a, an introduction to the, to the catapult and um, uh, what we do and what we offer and how we support innovators. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenges that we've seen in the UK specifically um, from local authorities and their journey into decarbonizing their transport sectors. Um, so the, the catapult is, and the energy systems catapult is part of a, of a network uh, that supports uh, businesses and uh, specifically um, SMEs and help them really uh, bring their products in, and services uh, to the market. Um, we are part of a, a wider network. We focus on the, on the energy system, but there are other centers that focus on uh, digital uh, solutions, manufacturing, specifically offshore renewables. Um, so it's, the catapults are kind of like a center where um, we accelerate research and we help uh, transform the market and bring new products and services into it, um, help innovators scale out their solutions and also provide um, skills, expertise and uh, facilities to innovators uh, as well. Uh, we also work in, in um, linking different types of organizations, so uh, and encourage collaboration between industry, government, and research organizations, academia, um, and we work with any, any types of, of businesses, really. Um, so more specifically, the energy system catapult, we were set up to accelerate the transformation of the energy system and to make sure that um, 
UK businesses and, and consumers capture the, the opportunity for, for clean growth. Um, as I mentioned, we're an independent and non-for-profit uh, organization. Um, and we and we're based in, well, we used to we're based in Birmingham, but now as everybody else, we're spread um, across different cities. We work remotely. Um, and really our key focus is on taking a system view and bringing in the, the views of all the different actors of the energy system to help understand how we can decarbonize our energy system. How can we identify and address innovation priorities, look at market barriers um, and achieve that uh, system transition at the, at the, lowest, at the lowest cost. Um, so we've, um, we work with, in, in the transport sector specifically, we work with SMEs um, in different areas. So from uh, charge points, manufacturers to, um, and I think Doug will be talking a little bit later. He's one of the innovators that, um, CTV is one of the uh, SMEs that we're supporting through various programs, but we, we also work with people that provide um, different platforms and software and solutions around, uh, for example, flexibility, support flexibility, but also um, in-home uh, solutions as well. Um, and as I said, cover a wide range of activities and look at not only homes and cities, but also look at national uh, level solutions as well. Um, we, um, we take a system view and what actually that means is that we don't look at transport in isolation. So we, we look at how transport, electrification of heat, industry, uh, all come together, the, obviously the electricity sector all come together and all um, address different synergies, um, but also looking to understand where the consumer's view is in all that. So really trying to understand and capture requirements from consumers to be able to deliver products to the market and solutions that they will be able to use and would address their needs. We've done quite a lot of extensive work around the electrification of heat, and we're now looking into uh, transports uh, in more detail as well. Uh, for that reason, we've got a, a network of, of homes, of real users that we um, basically use them as a virtual, uh, as a lab. Uh, we we um, allow our innovators to uh, install products in their homes. So we test response, we test how they, they would respond to different either solutions or, or hardware. hardware. Um, and we're able then to collect data and help um, innovators access different types of facilities as well. Uh, we also offer um, modeling solutions to local authorities to help them understand um, and what is kind of like their current uh, energy assets um, and different pathways for them to decarbonize the, the local area system in that case. So um, really understand how we bring in their transport or um, uh, electricity network requirements in and how, how we can really look into providing solutions that will be done in the most optimum way. Uh, and then we've got our national uh, modeling capability where we take that system view at the national level to look at different pathways uh, for uh, decarbonizing the whole of the energy system. Um, as I said, yeah, we don't look at just supporting innovators, but we do quite a lot of work, especially around homes, uh, systems, local places. We work with a number of local authorities to understand um, also their, their pain points and similar to what, what was done here, just to understand really where, where they're struggling and what is it that we would need to provide them and, to, and, and enable them uh, to provide the right charging infrastructure to, to consumers. And then we also work with sites, either that's industrial sites or um, systems like uh, ports, for example, and how we can yeah, transition them as part of the, of the system as well. Um, so just to put things into context, we're looking at a, at a big challenge if we want to be uh, net zero by 2050 in terms of emissions. Um, and especially with, with the transport sector, we're looking uh, from our uh, previous modeling work uh, at the full decarbonization of the transport sector. And that puts quite a lot of pressure on our electricity demand. 
uh, but also on our hydrogen uh, generation as well. I know we're not talking about hydrogen here today, but that's just to put things into perspective. We're doubling uh, our overall energy system energy demands between today and 2050. Um, and as I said, it's not just transport. Uh, in the UK, the carbonizing of uh, heating sector is quite a big challenge as well, and we need to look and identify the the synergies and to address conflicts. Um, we need to do the, the transition in a less disrupt disruptive way as possible. We need to optimize uh, and manage uh, costs. And for all that, we need to have that kind of like coordinated planning. We need to be able to take actions at different levels and we need to enable local authorities to, um, to make the right decisions, but also help them have the, the right collaborations and synergies, especially with the um, electricity sector uh, as well. So we've seen that obviously um, have, local authorities will have a great role to play in all that. Um, but we've also looked at different kind of like issues that they're facing. So, and also there are different types um, phases of their journey. For some of them, they're more advanced. Uh, they have uh, plans in place. Um, they're more engaged. Uh, they, but they would still struggle on maybe where to start or how to move forward. Um, we've seen quite a lot of issues with um, kind of like planning uh, processes, but also how to bring more investment in, how to encourage encourage then the. Uh, industry and the, the market players to, to be able to support them in providing the, the right charging infrastructure. Um, we also have a big issue here in the UK with people that don't have access to off-street parking. Um, so people that would primarily need to use um, on streets or near home uh, charging uh, solutions. And even for that, we need to do quite a lot of work still to understand how people are will be using these near home charging solutions in the future. And again, that's something that we're, we're looking in a little bit more detail in the last couple of years. Um, so that focuses around behavior and also understanding the, the differences between areas as well. So um, different solutions but more applicable for urban areas compared to rural areas in different parts of the country as well. So, and, and we see even more fundamental and basic questions around um, how, where to cite charge points and how do we go about doing that. Uh, but also, um, yeah, uh, even things like how do we access uh, the right skills and how do we access um, the right suppliers? How do we access uh, funding? So there's all these types of questions, that they still come in. Um, it's a great challenge, um, but there's already some work that has been done. We see a few kind of like innovators entering the market. We see charge points being deployed, and we see some local authorities being more more active in that in that space. Um, and just to to finish with kind of like and emphasize the need for the coordination and the planning. So what we see is we need that um, transport and other energy demands. Uh, we need to share infrastructure um, and we need to um, have kind of like the right planning uh, and processes in place. Um, but we also need to have synergies now at different levels of um, both regional and local and national um, authorities as well. Um, and also other things that were previously not treated in isolation and that were not linked things like land use, for example, uh, transport planning, uh, moving to um, more people on uh, public transport, for example, and how that, that would affect deployment of charge points. All these has been independent before, but now we need to bring in the different, uh, I guess, departments of, of local authorities together to tackle the challenge. And I think I'm gonna leave you to that because we're gonna hear from Jacob as well, I think on, on the specifics. Thank you very much, Thalia, for um, for explaining the um, some of the innovative work that the Energy Systems Catapult 
is now doing in the EV charging infrastructure space. So uh, much obliged. Next, I'd like to hand it over to Jacob Roberts, um, who is from the RAIA, the Association for Renewable Energy and Clean Technology. That's one of the largest um, renewable energy trade associations in the UK. Jacob, over to you. Thank you, Johan. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody on the call. I'll do the obligatory check to make sure that everybody can hear me before I say any more. Great stuff. That's good news. Uh, and now I will share my screen and do the second obligatory check that everybody can see what I'm sharing. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Super. My God, nothing's gone wrong so far. That's, uh, that's a welcome surprise. Um, well, it's very nice to, uh, to speak with you all today. Um, what I'm going to endeavour to do in the shortest time possible is give you a brief introduction of the Association for Renewable Energy and Clean Technology, the REA, um, an introduction to our EV forum, which is uh, particularly representing companies uh, focused on EV charging infrastructure deployment, um, and then a bit of a whistle-stop tour of some of the barriers to equitable charging networks that we've, uh, we've observed in the UK and some of the lessons we've learned there. And then hopefully, if I've got time, um, run you through a few uh, projects that we're currently involved in uh, looking at exactly this topic. Um, so to start off with, just a brief introduction to REA. Uh, we are a trade association that represents companies across all areas of, uh, of clean technology and renewable energy. Um, we have four broad pillars, one uh, being solar and storage, uh, one being organics, uh, which is things like composting, recycling. Uh, heat is an important one. The uh, electrification of heat is, a, is of great importance. And the area that I'm uh, obviously representing today is transport, within which electric vehicles is a, a very important part. Our work essentially is, uh, is influencing um, policymakers and also addressing the specific sector issues facing our members. In terms of the, the REA forum itself, we have around 100 members that come from all areas of the, uh, the EV charging industry. So we have charge point network operators, mobility service providers, roaming hubs, manufacturers, financiers, legal firms, consultancies, you name it. We're, we're a broad church and we represent a lot of different companies. Um, we have a steering group and an elected chair, which at this point in time is Tanya Sinclair, who's the policy director for charge point. I'm sure many on the call will be familiar with them as a, a US company. Uh, but our steering group also includes Osprey, Ionity and GridServe, who are all major charge point network operators in the UK, CodeCharger, who are a community charging um, solutions provider, and then Greenflux, Hubject, both back office data systems, um, Senex, who are a fairly well, uh, well regarded consultancy in the UK, and Drax, who are an energy provider. So just to give you a feel for how broad a church um, the EV forum really is. Uh, we work very closely with UK government, as you can imagine, and we are also the secretariat for the uh, all-party parliamentary group on electric vehicles, which had its AGM yesterday morning, which was great fun, I can tell you. Um, lastly, just uh, on the introduction to the EV forum, um, we also co-developed EV Roam, which is the OCPI, the Open Charge Point Interface ID database um, in the UK. And we co-developed the EV Consumer Code, which is a consumer protection standard for domestic charge point installers. So uh, we get around a bit, is, is the long story short. Um, lots of text on this slide. It's a theme of a lot of my presentations. And the reason for it is so I can share these slides with you afterwards. And hopefully they'll still make sense without my rambling. Um, but I just wanted to illustrate the equity um, leveling up the, uh, the infrastructure rollout and local authorities are really key policy themes that we currently explore within the EV forum. Uh, so it's very, very good to be able to talk with you today about some of the stuff that's going on in, in the UK and with the REA. Um, first thing I just want to go through, and I'll, I, there's a lot of slides here, again, with a lot of information that um, hopefully we can share with you afterwards and it will be good for, for reference. Um, in the UK, we've got quite a long history of funding local authorities to deliver EV charging networks um, and taking the, uh, the seven sort of issue, well, four, but then a, a subset of four more issues um, from the Electrification Co Coalition's report. Um, the reflection that, that I had is that an awful lot of these, at least in the UK context, um, you can attribute the, these kind of shortcomings to a lack of capability and a lack of capacity within local authorities. Funding in the UK has, has been made available to local authorities for quite a long time, um, but many local authorities haven't accessed that funding, uh, and those that have, haven't necessarily distributed the funding in a way that was delivering greatest value. Um, so the issues around equity and community engagement can really be overcome by building that capacity and capability, rather than necessarily throwing money at the problem. 
Um, the next few slides, I'll talk about some of our attempts in the UK to, uh, to actually overcome this through funding schemes. And this all began back in 2010 with something called the Plugged in Places Scheme. Uh, this was very much an exploratory scheme that provided funding for the, the establishment of, I suppose, the, the uh, pioneer EV charge point networks in the UK. Uh, and after five years of running these networks, uh, a report was produced identifying um, quite a few lessons learned, which I, I somewhat look at and think, my goodness, this was a long time ago now, and there's still a few of these lessons that we haven't actually learned. Uh, but uh, nevertheless was a really useful and important piece of work. And I think there was quite a few things we took from that exercise, which led to the, uh, the following attempt to, uh, to fund EV charging networks in the UK, which were the Go Ultra Low funding schemes, of which there were two. One that provided funding to local authorities uh, to deliver innovative infrastructure projects, and one that provided funding specifically to provide rapid charge points uh, or fast charge points, I think they're referred to in, uh, in the US. Um, for taxi and private hire use. Um, the, the point that I draw out of this slide is that of the 333 local authorities in the UK, only 29 grants were awarded. So these funding schemes, as useful as they are, only ever went to a very small number of local authorities. And many of uh, those who didn't bid for them then continued to lag behind for several years. Um, more recently, the UK government has introduced its on-street residential charging scheme, which was the first funding scheme targeted to reduce inequity between those that can charge off-street in a driveway or a garage and those that can't. Um, loads of funding was made available through this, but we also had the same problem that local authorities didn't always bid for the funding. And so there's some very sort of repeated mistakes, I suppose, that have been made and um, that I'll summarise in this next slide. And this one I'll dwell on for a bit longer because it's one of the more important slides. Um, I've sort of proposed some do's and don'ts uh, that I think from UK experience I can, I can suggest. Um, the first on the do's being uh, actually creating a charging infrastructure strategy. Um, a lot of local authorities didn't invest in this in the, in the early years of EVs. And as a result, uh, they stayed sort of behind the time for quite, quite a while. Um, involving both transport and energy stakeholders throughout the, uh, the process. Uh, making sure you take advantage of every dollar of funding that you get offered. It sounds like a, a given, but the amount of local authorities that I work with that didn't know what funding was available to them was, uh, was, was quite, quite startling. Making sure that funding is targeted at market failures um, is also really important. There's an awful lot that private investment can do in this area. And by throwing public funding into those areas, you're taking public funding away from where it might address a market failure. In the case of equity, that's a really important issue. Um, the other one I'll draw out of this as well is making sure you engage with local residents and businesses, because if you don't keep them on side, um, you'll find out too late that you haven't necessarily delivered what they want. Um, I'll, uh, again, kept these slides fairly uh, text heavy so that they could be referred to afterwards, but I'll, I'll move on to briefly talking about some of our more recent work in addressing this, uh, which is the last section of, uh, of my presentation. We're currently working with the UK government on developing something called the Local EV Infrastructure Fund or the Levi Fund, because apparently delivering EV charging networks is actually in our genes. Um, but the fund is being designed to address effectively not just the budget gap that local authorities face, but also the knowledge gap. So for the first time, the UK government is going to provide funding for local authorities to deliver EV charging, but they're also going to provide consistent and reliable advice and guidance through a support body that has recently been appointed. Um, this is a really big step forward. I think this is a model which I would thoroughly recommend um, in the US having the sort of the funding and the advice and guidance hand in hand. Um, we're also working on a report at this point in time looking at how to deliver transport decarbonization with an energy system perspective. And one of the key outcomes of that report has been uh, the need to join transport and energy sectors at a local level and make sure that all of the planning and deployment is coordinated from the beginning between transport and energy and not done in isolation, which has so often been the case. And then last but not least, we're also working um, with BSI Motability and the UK Office for Zero Emission Vehicles on accessibility standards for EV charging, which as far as I think we're aware, would be a global first uh, in providing um, very effective standards, which EV charging infrastructure has to meet in order to provide accessibility uh, to those with physical or, or mental impairment. 
um, and that covers uh, the design of the charge point, the uh, positioning and the, uh, the built environment around the charge point, and also the systems you use to access the charging infrastructure as well. And that's due to be published in August 2022, a really exciting project and, and very happy to be part of the, the steering group for that. And with that, at breakneck speed, um, I, hopefully that has been useful and um, I, I welcome anyone to get in touch with any further questions on, on any of those slides. And hopefully if we share the slides afterwards, uh, they'll be of some use as well. But um, pleasure to talk with you today and I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation uh, shortly. Thank you very much, Jacob, for going through those slides. Goodness, a lot of a lot of very useful information that you uh, you shared with us, and um, I'm sure um, folks will after the after the workshop um, have an opportunity to go through those slides and uh, and and fully understand and digest some of the the lessons learned that uh, that the REA has now experienced in the UK, and um, and so thank you for that. And I think that uh, that that practical practical sort of experiences and and solutions that you that you outlined sort of you know is, is a very good bridge to our next uh, section in the workshop where uh, where sarah reed of the electrification coalition she's going to be moderating the uh, the next two panel sessions where we're going to be diving um, a little deeper into the the particular challenges uh, and opportunities that um, that that four cities have experienced and then hear from the uh, the uk companies from what they hear. So um, over to you, Sarah. Great, thank you so much, Johan and Jacob and Thalia. That was great. Um, looking forward to hearing from some of our panelists over the next two sessions. So how this will work is we've got 30 minutes on these two topics and we'll hear from each of the cities and each of the companies and have a discussion around some of these solutions and barriers. And we're really looking to highlight what folks have done and also find new opportunities to move forward um, past these challenges. So this first panel will feature the city of Dallas and the city of Phoenix, um, an Arab and connected curb. And we'll be discussing the challenges and potential solutions for increasing staff capacity and bridging knowledge gaps. Um, I just wanna remind folks to Please put questions in the chat um, as they come up. We'll be um, checking for those and to also remind our panelists that after everybody does their introduction, you can also feel free to jump in with any of your questions or anecdotes um, to share. So I'm going to just get us started right away um, with FAR. If you could just tell us a little about your role and how Dallas has been thinking about this challenge, potential solutions, and any experiences that you wanted to share. Absolutely, Sarah. First of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting us to have this opportunity to share our experience um, with other communities. My name is Far Andrews. I'm the Senior Climate Coordinator here at the City of Dallas. I work in the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. I'm uh, just happy to be here today because um, some of the work we did, we really put an, an eye towards it being replicable for us to share it so that everybody could learn from it. Um, so what Dallas did is uh, we took in a, a really data-driven approach to how we can have a more equitable distribution of EV charging stations. Uh, Dallas is the ninth largest city in the U.S. and we have more than 7,300 electric vehicles registered as of December 21. Um, and regionally, that may not seem like much, but what we've observed over the last three years is a 35% annual growth rate in the number of electric vehicles that are being purchased. So in order to kind of stay ahead of that curve or on pace with that curve with our infrastructure, um, we really wanted to um, talk about how we can, how we, and how and where charging stations would make the most sense. And in 2020, the city of Dallas passed what we called our Comprehensive uh, Environmental and Climate Action Plan, which was the first climate plan in North Texas and very historic event. Um, it had eight different goals, 97 different actions. Our third goal was um, actually targeting um, sustainable transportation. So the goal was to uh, all Dallas communities to have access to sustainable, affordable transportation options. And we said one of the targets we set under this goal was to have 
1,500 EV charging stations by 2030. Additionally, we wanted to make sure that we had an equitable distribution and that we consider all populations uh, here in Dallas. So to start, what we did was we, um, we partnered with our local Clean Cities Coalition, which had a very similar mission to um, help us with an, an analysis of our uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, uh, what was existing so that we can make very informed decisions and recommendations to our elected officials. Um, and what we found out was, you know, starting with the Department of Energy's um, information is that we had like 176 publicly accessible EV stations um, that accounted for only about 398 plugs. And then what we did was we looked at vehicle registrations. Once we knew, where the public stations were, we looked at um, where the cars were. No surprise there. They were almost equally correlated, most in higher income populations, which kind of begged the question, would a more equitable distribution of charging stations um, advance um, adoption of EVs faster? Uh, so we kind of did a deeper dive into that and we started looking at um, where else do people charge? And from national statistics, what we learned from the Department of Energy is that 80% of the people charge at their home, um, over 80% actually. Um, and then thinking through that and looking at the landscape of Dallas where over 50% of our population here I live in a multifamily scenario, which means they live in apartments and condos and duplexes, and they may not have access to their own personal garages, which created a, a new barrier to EV charging infrastructure. Um, so then just diving a little deeper into that and looking at these multifamily um, properties uh, and thinking about how many of them have infrastructure, what we discovered is that only about 54% of the properties even had a charging station. Maybe not adequate capacity, but at least a charging station. But when we put um, environmental justice layer on our data, that number increased to almost 70% of multifamily um, housing in environmental justice areas without charging infrastructure, um, which illustrated that there was definitely some work that, that needed to be done. Um, so this, we, there was a lot of data crunching and then there was a lot more questions that the data could answer for us. So this exercise, uh, it, we felt like once we got to one conclusion, it, it led us down another route, but um, one place that we did land is there was a gap in our multifamily EVSE infrastructure here in Dallas. Um, and by focusing on that area, we could serve over half the population. So what do we do with this data? Um, there, were, there were really five things that we did. First, we, we put a, a layer over our data where we could see um, which council districts had infrastructure in which did it so that we could um, raise awareness for certain council members whose um, council areas didn't have infrastructure so they could become advocates for um, this service as well. Um, we also um, engage partners like our apartment association. We put newsletter articles, we did webinars, we talked directly to apartment owners and managers about um, the benefits of having this amenity available for their residents. Um, we also research funding that could be used to put infrastructure in uh, multifamily establishments and brought that information to them. We did mass mail outs. Um, we also worked um, with specific installers uh, and multi, we worked with our housing department. That was one thing that was really fruitful. Our housing department that builds low-income multifamily housing to make sure 
and to provide funding and to apply for grants so that during this construction process, there could be, um, it could be EV ready. There could be conduit, if not stations initially, but stations were really the goal. Um, so we're, we're still in year two of this cycle, but we're definitely starting to see it bear more fruit. Um, with a, the mitigation funds that we received from Volkswagen, after all this outreach to our multifamily here in Dallas, what we saw is the largest number of grant applications from the Dallas area came from the multifamily sector, which meant that the word was really getting out and they were starting to understand the benefits of this amenity. Um, and we're still working with specific apartment complexes uh, in environmental justice areas. Oh, I think my timer just went off. So um, I, I can stop there and I guess we'll do um, questions after. Thank you for giving me this time to share how Dallas approached our, our equitable distribution. Well, one way we approached equi equitable distribution of EVSEs. Thank you so much, Far. I know um, all of you cities could probably do a whole two hour workshop on all the awesome work that you've done. Um, Great. Well, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Karen, to talk a little bit about Phoenix. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name is Karen Apple. I am the EV program manager with the city of Phoenix. I'm in the Office of Sustainability. I'll give you a quick overview of what uh, the, some of the stats in, in the city of Phoenix, and then I'll kind of dive a little deeper into what we've been working on. So we are the fifth largest city in the United States. Our population is over 1.6 million people. Currently, we've got about uh, over 7,000 EVs registered in the city, and um, we've got 62 public accessible um, city deployed uh, EV charging stations currently. Um, back in 2021, the city council approved the City of Phoenix Climate Action Plan, which certainly had a section on transportation and how we can be the clean, cleanest and greenest desert city in the, in the US. And within this transportation section of the Climate Action Plan, uh, it had a few of EV goals. Uh, this was our first attempt at putting some EV goals out on the street for public engagement and comment. And those goals, um, focused around some fleet goals, some EV charging deployment goals, and certainly equi equitable goals, equity goals. Um, one of the goals in terms of EV charging deployment was to deploy an extra 500 on city-owned property by 2030. And we, current, we, we understand that, as I think Jacob mentioned, we are not the only solution. Uh, the city is just one solution to the problem. And EVs, we understand, are just one solution. We also know that micromobility and walking and mass transit are certainly other options to clean air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got some EV goals that are identified in our climate action plan. Also in 2021, um, our mayor, Gallego, is a, is a huge proponent of the environment and, and um, sustainability. And she initiated the EV ad hoc committee. And this EV ad hoc committee is, is uh, comprised of public members, uh, utilities, equity advocates, um, some folks that are in the EV space, some members of the public that are not in the EV space, but we wanted to hear their comments. And within that ad hoc committee, we've identified three subcommittees, one of which is education, outreach, and equity. Second subcommittee is public workplace and home charging infrastructure. And the third subcommittee is city fleet and city charging. Um, uh, again, comprised of 14 stakeholders. And we are just wrapping up the draft EV roadmap, which identifies goals, opportunities, um, areas for future review and um, deeper dives. And that will go to the city council in um, April as a draft and hopefully back to them in June. And within April and May, we're gonna do a robust um, full court press on just getting out to the community on the EV roadmap, knowing that we've got to get back out to the community to do a, a, 
an even larger, bigger, robust um, outreach on the entire EV program. But we certainly want to get the EV roadmap out into the community and get their feedback. Um, and and we and in terms of equity, and I think Jacob um, had a really good point in his presentation. We don't want to just deploy EV chargers wholesale. We certainly want to do it strategically and methodically. And we understand that we will we will need to do a needs assessment first out to our community to understand um, what their needs are. We know that some of our um, community members, uh, community residents don't even have driver's license. So we need to understand, um, is it bike shares, car shares, vouchers for transit, um, money off the hood of a used car, money off the hood of a new EV. So we need to really understand and build that trust and get out to our communities. And also the city of Phoenix is hiring an, um, an equity director. So we hope to partner with that equity director in better understanding um, our equity needs and communities. Um, and, and one of the challenges that we face, and we're, City of Phoenix is, is certainly what I would characterize in the early planning stages. Again, we want to be methodical. So we need to understand what is equity and how to define it. And then as FAR talked about, then we need to figure out what metrics and matri uh, metrics and evaluation criteria need to go into an equity map so that we can understand um, our income levels and educations and race and, and, and those kinds of metrics. But the EV equity map may look very different or slightly different than a housing equity map. So we are still trying, again, to be methodical and understand what, what is equity, how to define it, and what kind of ma mapping and metric tool can we use? So just to, and, and then just a couple opportunities is we've got the federal funding that's coming our way for the deployment, but we want to be ready um, and work with our internal department stakeholders and our external stakeholders to understand uh, the best places for deployment. Um, and then again, work with our planning and development team on how we can start developing our EV ready building codes. Because as Far mentioned, we've got the same issues as Dallas, where I'm assuming when we do that data crunch like Far did, we're going to identify the same issues where we are lacking in multifamily and in street side, curbside um, opportunities for EV charging. So I'll leave it there because I know I had a, a five minutes, but um, I certainly will happy to be here and, and happy to answer questions when we get to Q&A. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, so now I'll turn to our companies to just give us the quick overview of what they do and any response that you want to share right now before we jump into the discussion. So I will turn it to you, Vinny. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Vinny Rashik. I'm from Arup. Um, we are a global engineering firm. Um, we started out in the UK, but um, I'm I'm working in our New York office currently. Just coming back recently from a year in uh, in the Dublin office, working as part of the international uh, the intelligent mobility team there. Um, I'm a zero emission mobility planner, uh, and I'm going to give you just a quick overview um, of the types of things that we do and how we can help cities. Um, all of the conversations so far have spurred um, new things I want to talk about, and I know I have a short time, so I'll, I'll try and keep it brief and keep some more for the questions. But um, back about five or six years ago, we were working with New York City DOT on um, their EV fast charging plan. They um, started this process um, after Mayor de Blasio announced that by 2025, 20% uh, of new electric vehicle, uh, new vehicles registered in the city would be electric, um, which was an incredibly ambitious goal. Um, I think one that we will, um, I think I can safely say we probably won't meet, but um, we are making a lot of progress toward. Um, so the city then had this had this uh, mayoral target that they were they were intending to meet and trying to figure out how that they how they could support. Um, obviously, we have the federal rebate that helps um, for new EV purchases in New York State. We're very lucky to have a statewide rebate um, at the point of sale that also brings down the cost of a new electric vehicle. 
Um, but the city was trying to figure out what it could do to also support. And that came back, they, that came down to infrastructure. Um, so we looked at different places across New York City that uh, were owned by the city. They could invest um, in fast charging infrastructure and we developed a suitability analysis process um, looking at three different scenarios. One, which, which places would get the highest utilization of charging right off the bat um, to encourage the private sector to invest on their own. Um, another to look at equity where places that were likely to be um, needing infrastructure but not necessarily invested in terms of a, a utilization perspective from the private sector. And then another focusing on visibility, um, locations where we know that investing in um, charging infrastructure will get a lot of eyes on it and give people the confidence to, to, um, to purchase an electric vehicle and, and start to use it across the city. Um, that process uh, was part of a larger um, sustainability goal for the city. So prior to any talk about electric vehicles with New York City, the, the goal is 80% um, sustainable mode share by, um, by 2030. And, and, and that's the most important thing to, to think about and then, and then electrifying those remaining trips. Um, so as part of that, it, you know, we really wanted to think about how to, um, how to electrify other, other modes, modes that were other people are using um, and we're taking up most, we're accounting for most of the vehicle miles traveled in the city. Um, we started looking at taxi and vehicle, uh, taxi and um, delivery fleets, municipal fleets, and also public transportation as ways to um, improve the electrification and spread the benefits across more, um, more user groups. Um, as part of that process, we developed a suite of tools called Charge4. Um, charge for all, which focuses on an equitable approach to um, uh, identifying sites for EV infrastructure, both on street um, and, and off street for rapid charging stations. We did this with the LA um, Clean Tech Incubator, and we, throughout the process, spoke to uh, a bunch of different utilities in the LA area and in New York um, to understand uh, what their challenges were with installing infrastructure, um, how, to, how they were identifying sites, what the hangups were and what were the worries in the future. And a lot of it came, back, came down to interagency coordination, um, accounting for equity and how to plan for equity, uh, equitable distribution of infrastructure. Um, and, and then also just, you know, the, some of the common problems that were mentioned earlier in terms of trenching, digging up the street um, and trying to be most efficient with, um, with construction uh, and capital dollars. Um, so that resulted in a kind of a reform formulated version of our suitability analysis process that we did with New York City DOT. Um, one minute left. And so, and what we're currently working on is our uh, tool called Charge for Fleets, which is helping look at electrifying primarily right now um, transit fleets, but also um, medium and heavy duty vehicle fleets and municipal fleets. Um, we, we do this through a process of assessing energy demand within, within the fleet electrification process identifying um, feasibility and scope for com converting electric buses or vehicles, right-sizing the charging infrastructure and power supply and evaluating scenarios to optimize the investments. Um, we really believe that this is, it's most important to focus on um, transit electrification right now because of the benefits being spread across um, um, commun communities more broadly and those who have historically been um, impacted by poor air quality and carbon emissions. Um, and we also think this is a huge opportunity to um, catalyze the electrification of medium and he heavy duty vehicles that deliver um, goods, goods and services across our, our communities, which also tend to um, impact uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, I'll try and, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Vinny. Um, okay, over to you, George, our last speaker for this panel. Hi there, how are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So um, I'm George Donoghue, uh, the Chief Technology Officer at Connected Carib in the UK. Uh, we are a charge point operator infrastructure provider in the UK who is scaling up particularly to deal with uh, challenges in local authority areas. Um, one of the, the key data points, uh, just like Farr was saying, in the UK, 60% of people who will eventually have an EV don't have a driveway. So they need some level of street parking, either within their geography, within five minutes and two minutes. And there's an interesting point of data on that. If somebody has to walk five minutes, there's an 80% drop off of wanting to bother. 
If they have to walk two minutes to their charger, there's a 40% drop off. So what's really interesting is users actually have some insights themselves about what they find acceptable for going to a charger. Um, and, and the key five things we've learned in terms of what we need to do to facilitate the rollout of EV adoption, because it is coming, is in five key categories, largely around education and particularly with local authorities. So what we found is one, when we've engaged with local authorities, they tell us our citizens don't need EVs, they don't want EVs, they don't believe it's coming. So then we share with them and work with them in partnership to share some data insights about what their citizens are actually saying. So, for example, in some environments we've worked in, 80% of local citizens say there needs to be more public charging and maybe they'd go for an electric vehicle. Some local authorities find that surprising. Um, 70%, 74% of their citizens don't believe the government's doing enough about it. They found that surprising. Um, when we talk about 66, 67% would buy an EV if they knew the other two things were getting dealt with, that I mentioned first, then they would adopt an EV. So we tend to work with the local authorities, one, primarily around education themes, not about selling a charger, not selling about we've got the best things in sliced bread, but actually facilitate that rich dialogue to educate the colleagues they work with and the people that are making decisions in those areas. And we think that's a really important part. So listen to your citizens is the key thing that we started working hard with on local authorities. And by doing that, enrich the partnership and enrich the trust between what we're trying to do as a network. And then as a network, we're trying to provide charters in the right place for citizens for utilization that give them what they need to be accessible and affordable, which is a key priority for local authorities with their citizens. There's no point putting one or two charges in different areas that are 50, 60 pence per kilowatt hour that disadvantage the fuel poor who can't enjoy the benefit of it. However, if you roll out five or six in the right area and keep the price down and make it accessible, then of course that becomes a really important part of sites. So site selection is one of our key tools. We use AI, we use lots of data sets, we work with the local authority, we say, well, you, did you realize you've got a bus stop there? Did you realize you've got things here that disadvantage your citizens? And one of the really interesting things that comes out of that is that we find people that are in disadvantaged areas travel further with cars than are people that have better jobs, because in some respects they can work from home. So some people in fuel poor environments have two or three jobs and have to travel far more in one day. And therefore, they need access to cheaper transportation. And, and this was a key eye opener for some of our uh, local authority colleagues. Um, so that's important. Third is the hardware. The hardware has to be endurable. It has to last for the longer term. It has to last 15, 20 years. Therefore, people get certainty about what's going on with those assets, not assets that may fail in two years, three years, and so on. So that's a really important part of what we offer. And of course, we encourage it with local authorities so that they can get the benefit of those things. Engagement's a really important theme on the fourth topic. So we often engage with the local authority about collateral, marketing collateral, how you can create a compelling education launch campaign, how you can get communication channels opening up between flyering, newsletters, magazines, re-educate people about the real agenda uh, that's going on with electrical vehicles and how you can have a digital strategy. And again, we facilitate some of that stuff. And the fifth, the fifth theme across all of this stuff, and we encourage any CPO to do this, is partnership. So that's things like profit shares on the utilization on the chargers, providing a way for it to be a, a core partnership with the local authority, not just put a charger on a street and then we make the money only. So the, the, there's the, the combination of those factors to recap is we've learned you need to listen to your citizens and feed it back to local authorities and help with education. You need to get the right site selections for the blend for utilization, but the citizens as well. Um, hardware's got to last. It's got to last 15, 20 years. Engagement, provide the right materials and collateral for the local authorities to work with. And then partnership, whatever you do as a network rolling that out, it's got to be in combination with the interest of the local authority, not just a commercial proposition that self-serves the network. And those are the five th themes that we've found as we've grown the organization. And I'll, I'll leave it there. I've no idea if I've hit my five minute marker, but I at least tried. <laughs> I think you did perfect. Um, well, thank you all for providing some of your insights into this challenge. And I think 
George, I'm really interested in the education piece that, that you were just speaking about, because um, I know some of the cities that we talked about have the misinformation around EVs, and we experience that also a lot in our work. So I was just curious if you could kind of give a more specific example of, of like an education component or push that um, you did in one of your Yeah, cities. so there's three themes. Um, one is educating citizens that if we put it on their street, would they, would they want it and, and do that? personal insight so that's really important for a local authority because one or two citizens will say to people um i i don't need this charger i don't need it there but actually when you go out to the overall community they might give you some insights that says actually i would buy an ev if you put one on my street and often the question comes the other way around and so there is a bit of false data false flag kind of kind of data that comes if you don't write ask the right questions from your citizens um, I think the, the, the second thing that I think about engagement is having the right kind of marketing tools for your customers about batteries and how batteries last. Um, one of the key things that people think about batteries in cars is like an iPhone charger, but it's not. <laughs> it, it, it's thousands of little cells in a car that will last well beyond 10 years, in fact, longer than possibly the car itself. So a lot of the collateral that we do is about trying to get some of those messages across, tell them it's coming soon, debunk some of the perceptions. And then the last thing we work really hard on is the affordability um, in terms of the costs of EV on fuel is about two thirds cheaper than it is for diesel or petrol in the UK. Um, and, and if you can give people access to that level of data, it certainly wakes them up a little bit. I mean, just as a personal example, when I talk, I'm a 10 year EV driver and I used to try and convince people about the, the, the decarbonization part of EV ownership. And that wasn't terribly convincing. But when I say to them, it cost me 14 pounds to drive 600 miles versus their 90 pounds or hundred pounds, it wakes them up pretty quick. And, and I think we find when we work with local authorities, some of those engagement messages and collateral is so powerful to just get people excited enough and interested enough to engage with the topic and then move them forward from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I want to be sure I get to some of these questions in the chat too, and then give you all a chance to kind of respond to some of the things that you heard. But far quickly, I don't know if you wanted to touch on the question about if you've had cooperation or buy-in from the utility and if um, they have any incentive programs that have aligned with what Dallas has done. So we've had a great participation from our local utility. They, you know, have a vested interest in uh, creating more, uh, more, more sources for themselves, but they've also created programs where, um, as we encourage, like, multifamily facilities, even commercial, um, to install charging stations, they've dedicated staff to go out and uh, view the, the facility the property, make recommendations, ensure that they have um, the, the proper load that they need to um, install the equipment that they're looking at. Um, so there's there's been some real hands-on participation from our utility company to get EV infrastructure. And they've also been great partners when we're applying for grants. It looks like we're, we're going for um, a regional grant and they're, they're both signing on and taking a very active role in that. So they're a, a great partner to have along this journey. Great, and I know we'll touch on that a little bit as well in the next session. Um, and then George, there's a question for you in the chat on um, using connected curb in the US would require the driver to bring the cable, which is actually a good way to ensure use by immediately local residents. Are there any good solutions in the UK for on-street charging that have attached cables? Um, so in terms of cables, and remember, we're talking about the longevity of an asset base. So if you're a local authority or, or a municipality, you want to know that things are going to last 15, 20 years. And um, if you have a tethered cable, you're creating a point of failure it's going to be plugged in plugged in used 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 and get broken trodden on stepped on so the costs for that asset will increase and increase and increase and of course that becomes a cost burden to the consumer and for the council that's invested in the property and the charging network 
So we do not recommend tethered solutions for long dwell, multiple use uh, AC charging networks. It's absolutely fine for a DC rapid charger because that, that is something where it's quite bulky, quite heavy and quite robust. And it, of course it can be plugged in and out. And the overall cost of a DC asset for replacement of that plug, it becomes quite, an, it's an acceptable commercial business case. But if we're going to deploy a charger on the street, we would rather have an untethered solution so the consumer brings their own and thereby the whole cost of the system comes right down over the 10, 15 year term. So we certainly wouldn't recommend tethered solutions on street charger solutions. It's definitely an uneconomic way to go. Um, I'm curious if Karen or Far or Vinny have any thoughts on that answer. Yeah, this is Karen. Um, I think that's a great solution because we've already had a few of our charging stations uh, vandalized um, to bring your so to bring your own cord. But what we find it's not really the cost of the piece of equipment. And we certainly, I agree, George, we want it to be durable and, and long lasting. But we, what we find is it's not really the cost of the equipment, it's the cost of the install. That's the majority of the, the, the cost structure. So if we can find ways to bring the install cost down, and we certainly like FAR, we partner with our utility uh, partners who without them, we wouldn't have been able to deploy another 40 public um, accessible chargers on, on a Phoenix property. So um, any, any um, information you can provide on how you've tried to keep costs down or any of your clients or, or things like that? Absolutely. It's, it's top of our mind, right? Because one of the things, again, we're trying to serve communities with fuel poor disadvantage environments to accelerate adoption of EVs. So that, that's our mission, right? Accessible and affordable. So the, one of the ways we've achieved that is if you look behind me on the pillars, they're just sockets, the actual chargers below ground. So one of the things that's really important about an infrastructure approach is if you can provide a protected node or power box in the ground that then lasts 15, 20 years with a duration and the lower amount of cost is the top. If it does get damaged, vandalized, abused, it's such a small part of the cost of the system, it's absolutely fine to crack on and, and do something remediation on it. And then, of course, the overall cost over the term doesn't get passed on to the consumer. So what we've done as, as, as a very conscious mindset is a below ground and above ground approach. Uh, and then, of course, in 15, 20 years, if the local authority doesn't want to see our things above ground, then that's fine. They can they can make a different choice. And um, so you're giving that long term assurance to the network that the, the, the local authority they're not play, they're not making a bad bet. They're not stuck with a bunch of stuff that they don't like. Um, and and by splitting it out, we found that that's the best way to get the most efficient cost over the 15, 20 years. It, the natural DNA of a CPO is to put a charger above ground and it's a box. And of course, that comes with a, if it gets broken, you're done, you have to replace it problem. So it, it, that's how we that's how we deal with that. Um, I, oh, go ahead, Far. I was just about to share one of the lessons learned here in Dallas um, that we've been uh, with everyone that we promote these two is you know, think really invest in the operations and maintenance piece of this because another gap that we found in the Dallas area is in green jobs. Like it's very hard to find um, a technician that um, is certified or capable to make the repairs. Um, so when you purchase um, the equipment and you have an opportunity to initially get your O&M, in place at, um, at a, a reasonable rate. I know we've been building it into our initial contracts um, and we've had some real responsive vendors. Usually when we have maintenance issues, they're out there in 24 hours. I mean, we put stipulations in there, but um, that's, that's one way we've been responding to the concern of how do we keep these operational in light of the fact that um, we're kind of behind the curve on, on green jobs and technicians in this area. And I want to, Vinny, give you a chance to jump in too on some of the cost or um, other challenges that they've brought up. Yeah, sure. Um, on, the, on the cost side, um, definitely utility um, partnerships is really important in New York, both Con Ed and um, in New York's 
New York Power Authority have programs to help with the installation and then incorporating um, five years of, of O&M into the contracts um, as a way to kind of soften those those initial costs and um, over the first you know few years of likely lower utilization, especially when you're talking about um, fast charging infrastructure. Um, in addition to that, uh, New York is in the process of um, developing a user supplied cord pilot, which is um, kind of what George is talking about. I think it's pretty, it's a pretty new concept maybe in, in the States um, to think about, you know, bringing your own cord and parking on the street and then um, connecting. But um, I think certainly it, there's definitely value, especially from the, from the maintenance side, as George was talking about um, our current uh, chargers on the street. Um, they have these big kind of like almost hangers to basically keep the, keep the plugs off the ground, keep the wires off the ground. Um, and it's just another piece of, of infrastructure on a crowded sidewalk. So, um, it's a bit of a just challenge, another, just another cost, <laughs> <laughs> another cost. And, yeah. And, and also from the public, public design perspective, um, it, it, it can be a challenge. So, um, the, the other thing I would say is as part of that, we're trying to figure out a way to integrate the charger into um, into standard on-street uh, equipment that's already there, namely light poles right now. Um, it's not a lot of space in there. There's a lot of equipment that's already in light poles and on the light poles, but um, it can smooth the process of getting public design commission in New York City to approve, uh, approve it, roll it out, and then also have a standard piece of equipment that DOT can replace when when light poles are reaching the end of their life um, and also provide some protection too. I have a question on that, if I may. Mm -hmm. Would that provide enough kilowatts for the charging experience? Uh, yes. So um, in the process of, of redesigning the light poles, I think a lot of them are, we're looking at um, uh, two, four, bringing 240 volt power through the light poles um, and and doing so to um, ensure if there's future proofing for um, for uh, level two charging, but I would also say that you know I, I'm I'm softening on the idea that maybe level one charging, um, spreading level one charging, um, providing in more places means that we need less level two and, and fast charging infrastructure. Um, you know, there's certain power there's power related challenges for spreading that infrastructure. And if we have level one chargers everywhere, um, maybe we need fewer of those. So um, using the existing 110 one service um, where we have light poles might be a way to give people some access to, you know, the ESIPs overnight as they're called. And, yeah, I think um, there it's very interesting because there has been a lot of piloting with what you both are talking about in the US, but curious, I mean, we could do a whole nother session on just this one topic. So I hate to cut off the discussion, but I know it's a good transition into the next one, which does incorporate more utilities. Um, so hopefully we can all think of this workshop really as the chance of future conversations and introductions and um, can kind of go forward in that way. So thank you so much to George and Vinny and Karen and Farr for your insights um, into this topic. And we'll go ahead and go into our next session around utility and city collaboration, where we have the city of Charlotte, the city of Baltimore, city EV and wood. And so just a reminder to all the, the next panelists that um, you each have about four or five minutes, and then we will get into a, just a couple of questions. So to kick us off, I will turn it over to you, Heather, from the city of Charlotte. Sorry, I was I was uh, setting my timer. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so uh, good afternoon. My name is Heather Bolick. I am with the Office of Sustainability and Resilience at the city of Charlotte. And uh, I'm my work mostly focuses on our sustainable infrastructure strategy. And that means for now, our EV charging infrastructure, as well as uh, our solar on municipal buildings and um, battery storage. So I wanted to share with you um, a few images. And so just because I, I think pictures tell a thousand words and only have five minutes. So um, this is a map of our charging stations and um, these are just city-owned stations, so there's 
Yeah, and we account for about 41% of all the chargers in the city are owned by the city. Um, and you can see these sort of shaded areas of corridors of opportunity. Um, and so we need to do obviously more work around that. You can, you can see our corridors of opportunity are basically locations where um, of underserved communities. So um, I do also wanna show you uh, a picture of, of our solution. So we uh, partnered with Duke Energy, our, our utility, um, and UNC Charlotte, and our local uh, COG to um, institute this uh, utility pole charger, which is not um, earth shattering to any of you, but <laughs> in North Carolina, it's, it's the first of its kind. And um, we have uh, partnered together, not just to see, you know, what this charger, um, you know, just to install a charger, but really to work through the whole process of it to see what all, you know, if it was really scalable and, um, you know, really try to see what, uh, what, it, what it would mean for our community. Our community. Um, so this, this specific charger, I will say the, the whole project started with UNC Charlotte from a grant through the Department of Energy. And I think really the, the value that the city provided was um, figuring out the location um, and, and, and engaging with the community because that's, that's more of our core work, you know, is engaging with our community, understanding the needs of our citizens and, um, you know, making sure that it was in a good, a good location. Um, we've all, we also, you know, went through things like making sure that it was accessible. So we had, we, we um, made sure that we had our, our partner with DOT to uh, put in a ramp for us for the, for the charger. And um, it was, it's, it's really pretty cool, you know, Duke Energy is an investor-owned utility regulated in North Carolina. And, you know, partnering with them kind of helps, you know, move things along, if you will. Looks like Heather may have frozen. See, give her a couple seconds, see if she comes back. <laughs> no, Heather. All right. Okay, well, hopefully she will get back to us. Um, and we can come back to her to help her um, finish up some of her talking points, but um, I'll move us along while she gets her computer sorted. So Kira, if you don't mind jumping in from Baltimore, that of would be great. And I'll see if I can get her screen. Oh yeah, there we go. Her screen went away. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I am going to share a presentation. One second. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Hi, and thank you for the opportunity to share our experiences in the city of Baltimore. I am Kier Harris. I am a leader in the city of Baltimore's electric vehicle charging infrastructure initiative. Um, the city is proud and excited to share that we have made significant progress in bringing electric vehicle charging infrastructure to the city. Um, and most recently with our utility company, Baltimore Gas and Electric, which will be referred to as BGE hereafter. So the city of Baltimore is a municipality located in the state of Maryland with a long history as an important seaport. Um, according to the 2019 U.S. Census Bureau, our population estimate was 600,032. We have been a leader in the state in introducing EV charging stations and city-owned parking facilities. Um, and for the past several years, we have had 41 publicly accessible level two, char level two charging stations in our parking lots and garages. 
In 2019, a public, I mean, a multi-agency EV work group was established. Um, EV work group includes members from multiple city agencies and collectively we drafted and fully executed a memorandum of understanding between BGE and the city to facilitate the installation of EV charging stations on city owned all street properties. The MOU outlines the agreement for the installation and the maintenance within city limits. Some of the terms um, in this agreement was BGE's ownership for funding, um, supplying electrical power, technical labor, labor, and also maintenance for all installations. It was also required monthly reporting of data analytics from each charger. Um, that also that every station must be made available to the public on a first come, first serve basis, 24 hours per day. That BGE meets a 30% equitable installation distribution within under, underserved areas of the city. That BGE shall repair, remove, replace any broken or damaged EV stations within 48 hours after discovery or notification. That if BGE removes an EV station for an approved location and does not replace it, um, that they must restore all city-owned property to its original condition. And finally, that BG shall, shall provide and file a five-year repair and maintenance plan for EV stations with the city. Additionally, the EV work group spearheaded efforts to introduce franchise agreement legislation before city council. Um, this would allow BGE to install electric vehicle chargers on street. And it was approved and signed by the mayor December 2020. Sorry, skip the slide. Expanding electrical vehicle, vehicle charging infrastructure provides greater access and also EV adaption. We determined that the best way to select equity zones was to, to use the lowest income quartile census tract, or in other words, the areas within the lowest 25% income in the city. We wanted to focus on areas that don't have all street parking or neighborhood residents might be able to afford an EV vehicle, but can't afford the incremental expenses of installing a personal electric vehicle charging station on their property. So that said, we considered the following data set data sets to select the best locations for charger placements. Um, data sets that were used include redevelopment areas or areas within an impact investment or major redevelopment, areas with mean or high population density, areas with high visibility and near an interstate by a quarter of a mile, um, equity zones or areas within the lowest income quartile census tract, areas within a quarter mile of hospitals or grocery stores, and then finally row homes um, or the housing stock for residents who don't have off street parking. We developed an online application form with electronic reviews and approvals that streamlines the process. We also develop a page on our website for information about EV charging stations um, to publicize the charging stations that are available for use at city owned properties, a list of upcoming publicly accessible EV chargers, links to other electric vehicle charging station listings, and also a comment card for public installation location requests. Um, to date, BGE has installed 20 electric vehicle charging stations of which 14 are level two and six are DC fast chargers. BGE has been given full approval to install an additional 25 chargers. And lastly, we are currently working with BGE on the installation applications for 20 additional um, electric vehicle charging stations. And this, can, this concludes my presentation. So thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Kira. Very organized um, through your slides. <laughs> um, great, we'll now go to Doug from City EV. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, uh, if you're in the United States. Um, so my name's Doug Watson, and I work with uh, City EV. Uh, our, our USP is that we um, uh, can uh, utilize existing street furniture, uh, lamp columns, uh, walls of buildings, uh, any street furniture to uh, facilitate a, an electric vehicle charge point. So you see some examples of those uh, uh, behind me. 
Um, but, but just in terms of, of some of the learnings, uh, you know, we work with local authorities, with organizations who have the relationships with cities. Um, and some of our learnings, well, you know, that I would say that we're not the silver bullet, right? <laughs> it's very strange from somebody selling, selling their technology. So, so on this call, you've got some great companies. Um, so Connected Club, great company, right? In, in some aspects, a competitor, but actually very complementary. So um, what I mean by we're not a silver bullet, as a city, you need to facilitate multi-vendor systems, right? So you need to uh, allow multi, multi, multiple vendors in, in, uh, and coordinate that uh, within a network. Um, but the simple thing also is, is reducing that civil work um, element will allow you to deploy more charge points for your buck. And that's where, um, it, it, for, from my perspective, utilizing uh, lamp columns, um, especially where you don't need to dig up and put earth mats in, um, you know, we're seeing deployments and installations in 15 minutes, typically in London, where we have a few thousand uh, already being rolled out. Um, the other thing I like to say is, is bay marking. If you have a charge point, um, uh, it, it's really frustrating when a, a, a diesel vehicle or petrol vehicle is parked there. Um, you know, clearly the utilization of that uh, infrastructure goes down when uh, when it's not clearly used by an electric vehicle. So bay marking is is, is key. Um, from an end user and equity perspective, make it simple. Right. So the simplest thing is get a credit card out or a debit card and tap and go. Um, what we're seeing in, in London is a, is a move away from individual apps um, where you might have uh, roaming between one city and another city and you've got two, two different apps. You know, what we're seeing is that people, certainly authorities, are, are trying to encourage a simplistic mechanism for, for payment and roaming. And that seems, seems to be the, uh, the good old credit card. Um, certainly in London, what we're seeing in, in terms of encouragement is that local authorities are now making it open for their residents to apply for a, 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 a charge point. So if you bought an electric vehicle charge point and you happen to not have a place to park, you can apply to, to your local authority and say, give me one of these things on the nearest uh, lamp column closest to me. Um, and the authority will not only put one on the street, they'll actually look at putting the whole street <laughs> because typically uh, neighbors like to see whatever their other neighbors are and it does encourage other people in the, in the neighborhood to, uh, to take up the purchase of an electric vehicle. Um, one other element is, 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 to, is to allow somebody with pe or, or people they choose to phone up and have a person at the end of the phone. So sounds simple, but I, you know, I, I get frustrated just phoning my bank and having to type one for this and type two, uh, pick up the phone, phone the number and a person's there saying, how can I help you? Uh, and dedicated to solving their, their real life issues, right? So um, all, all of that is, uh, is fine. Um, data, I would say that as a city, you, you also have a lot of data that you might not recognize. So think about your community nurses, your social workers, any public employee who's out there in the street. If you know where they're going, remember in a few years time, they're gonna be driving an electric vehicle. Right? So, so if you have that data of where they're going now, you'll know where they're residing, where they're dwelling, where they are, where they're going. And those are the places where you might wish to deploy some electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Okay, so, um, and then the last point, just um, again, one point that George made, utilizing existing infrastructure, a lamp column. You know, in London, we have some very old infrastructure, <laughs> um, some Victorian uh, cabling, and you, you have to use what's there sometimes. Um, sometimes it may need upgrading, but if it's there and if it's used, you know, I, I think a four kilowatts can be four kilowatts that you get out of a seven kilowatt charge point but it's there for people who are residing in over eight, 10 hours and dwelling there. So typically that will be enough. So that's it. I think I've done about five minutes. I'll, I'll stop there and allow you guys to ask any questions. Uh, happy to uh, talk further.
Great. Thank you so much, Doug. And thanks for bringing data back up. I know that's kind of what FAR started with and how important that's been to some of their EVSE work. Um, so just a reminder to please put any questions that you have for the speakers in the chat or message them to me. Um, we'll go to our last speaker for today, Steve from Wood. Yeah, I appreciate it, Sarah. And uh, good afternoon. Good morning to everyone. Just uh, really appreciate the invitation to talk to this group today. Certainly uh, a lot of enthusiasm and interest in this topic. And it's really changed uh, so many different markets from the, the power and the transportation to cities, municipalities. So um, exciting times that we're in. Um, I will try and stick to my five minutes here, but for introductions, I'm Steve Kaiser. Uh, I sit in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, and I work for Wood. Um, if you're not familiar with Wood, we are a UK company, but have a pretty significant presence uh, here in the US, uh, a little over 15,000 employees. Um, doing a lot of work in a lot of different areas, but uh, relevant for the discussion today, um, supporting uh, most aspects of, of EV deployment from a planning uh, and engineering perspective primarily. Uh, and then I'll say on a limited basis on, uh, on implementation and construction work. Um, but as part of this panel, it's kind of stepping back and looking at it from a, a lens of the work that we do on the utility side and, and trying to be a bit of a bridge between the work and relationships we have on the utility side and certainly the work and support that we do um, with our, our cities, towns, and municipality uh, partners. Uh, so trying to kind of look at it through that lens and, and come up with some of the, the challenges, the barriers, and hopefully some, some solutions. And certainly the funding looked like from the survey results was a, a big uh, barrier to entry in, in this uh, EV deployment equation. Um, really kind of looking at it from two different perspectives on that funding. Uh, there's been some discussion and really great to hear. I think it was far mentioned uh, the utility partnership and some joint grant uh, pursuits that they've had. And, and I think some of the other panelists have addressed that as well. Uh, I think that's certainly uh, really effective when you can partner a, a city with utility as opposed to going at it uh, you know, on your own. I think that makes for a very uh, effective partnership uh, even if the grant is not successful, I think there's su success that comes through building those partnerships, understanding the needs of, of the different stakeholders and uh, hopefully continued collaboration, even if a grant uh, is not successful. Uh, but also from a funding perspective, I think it's important to look at the, the utility side and the uh, gaining acceptance from the Public Service Commission, uh, which gives the utility uh, the ability to have rate recovery, which is a pretty important, pretty big deal. Uh, for them, and they certainly have a vested interest in, in selling more electrons. And I think it is truly that that win-win for everybody that they get to deploy uh, more infrastructure and resources that allow them to, to sell more power. And certainly the cities can provide a valuable service to their constituents and, um, and, and residents in the area. And, and there was a couple that were mentioned on here. Uh, I know in uh, Arizona, Karen, I think you mentioned um, uh, some of the partnerships with uh, likely APS and, and Tucson Electric. Uh, I know both are uh, covering the Arizona area and, and have uh, public service commission uh, programs set up for their reporting of EV deployments. Um, it was mentioned uh, from Arup about the New York City partnership with Con Ed, I think is a great example of, of success. Um, I mean, I could go on down the list. State of New Mexico just came out with a plan uh, George has got their, their make ready program. So you're seeing a lot of acceptance from the public service commissions on the utility side, which again, I think frees up some capital uh, for the utilities to partner in, uh, and deploy vehicles. Uh, but on the infrastructure and planning side, I think that that's been discussed as well. Really good comments around, uh, you know, a lot of that work. Um, I, I love the fact that the data driven uh, solutions have been brought up and, and that was certainly something that I wanted to touch on is, um, having the data to define the, the successful deployment and adoption of EV infrastructure is such a big deal. Um, at Wood, we use a, a digital twin model as part of our software solutions and uh, looking at that breadcrumb data uh, that George, I think, uh, excuse me, Doug, that you just brought up. Um, so critical to have that data and understanding where folks are going and how they would potentially use it because the need for today is gonna be very different two years, five years from now as EVs become uh, further adopted. So I think using those data-driven solutions to help model uh, the successful deployment is, is a, a really big deal. Um, you know, and I guess I'll close out. I know I'm kind of at my time here, but 
again, looking at things from a utility perspective, um, they're spending millions, in some cases, billions of dollars on improvements to the transmission and distribution you know, grid system. And I think it's important to, to leverage that, take advantage of programs and spends that are already happening, infrastructure improvements that are already happening, uh, to partner with those utilities to make sure what they are designing and implementing is, in fact, uh, EV ready and EV capable. Um, it, it makes sense if they're replacing, you know, wooden poles with concrete poles or, or burying power lines that they uh, make sure it's got the power demand that's needed and certainly the, the EV infrastructure, at least EV ready um, for future adoption as we're going through these major spend and these major programs. So I'm probably at the end of my time here and I'll uh, go ahead and close it out. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks for all of your comments tying some of the speakers together. I appreciate that. Um, Heather, I want to be sure to go back to you um, so that you can finish um, some of your comments about the work that Charlotte and Duke have done together. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, anyway, um, I, I I'm just I'm happy to answer any questions. I didn't I didn't get a chance to really uh, talk about it more, but um, you know. To, I was thinking about um, Doug's point about multiple vendors when he was talking. And, um, you know, one thing that we've looked at is that, um, you know, it's not just about providing these chargers in the right locations, like I talked about with the corridors of opportunity, but it's giving um, opportunities to local businesses, small minority women-owned businesses to get into this business. Um, and that just that just struck me about, you know, what he said. Um, we're hopeful with, with what we've done with Pole Vault. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot of challenges uh, with with the project. You know, we, we had to work through things like is this allowable in the public right of way to put like different, you know, certain slides up because it's a LCD panel, you know, on the charger that, um, you know, has some content on it. Um, so there's just so many integral parts, but I think it's, it's helped educate everybody on, uh, it's helped the util utility educate itself it's helped um, the city understand like who all should be involved and at the table. Um, and so, I, I mean, it's been a great project. I hope, I hope to um, continue the work and I'll stop there. Great, thanks so much, Heather. Um, I think that one of the bigger challenges that some of the cities in the US have um, struggled with was just who owns some of the light poles or light columns, as, as Doug had said. And I'm just curious if that's a challenge in the UK or kind of how some of that ownership structure works. Well, certainly in the UK, um, ownership is, is, a, is a little bit clearer. So, so we're um, typically either the local authority or the uh, light uh, electricity company, or there may be um, a, a, a sort of halfway house where there's a, a third party company uh, that's providing a, a public uh, partnership. Um, uh, but that sort of ownership model is, is a lot clearer in the UK. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I'm, I got a question here too um, that came into me via chat that's kind of for the cities I think about. For, for those who haven't worked too much with their utility yet, they're wondering what are some of the best ways to get started on that? And I know, Kira, you mentioned a working group, like if that has been one of the key strategies um, or other ways to just sort of build that relationship into something that you both have with, with your local utilities. Right. So yeah, we we work directly. We we meet with our utility company at this point every week. Um, where we, you know, we use that opportunity to talk and discuss about these potential locations. Um, and then we and we also, you know, we vet locations as well before we even, you know, bring it to them. I mean, just to kind of touch on ownership in the United in, in Baltimore, we do kind of, it's not as clear, which is why we 
created that EV work group to bring in who we thought would be, who are, who are a lot of owners within the city um, so that the utility company knows that, you know, we're all on the same page together. The utility company knows what the um, workflow process is and that there's no deviations from that plan. Um, and we always start out with an application that they submit to us. And then the parking authority, which is who I'm with, we then reach out to the owner of that parcel. Um, and then we go from there to, you know, to make sure that everybody is in, agree in agreement and we see the plans and we get, you know, we get all the appropriate signatures. That's great. And then we have a question that came in that maybe Steber Kira could also answer, but some older multifamily apartment buildings do not have adequate power infrastructure to install EV charging. So do any of the cities or Steve in your case work that you've done it would, um, do any of the cities doing this have a program to help fund install of the infrastructure at a lower cost and to show the value proposition of investing in that, especially for lower cost apartments where there is not a lot of current EV ownership? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start in some of our experience um, in this space. I mean, this is where the grants uh, do come into play. Uh, there is some really uh, good money that's out there for this exact application. Um, you know, I mentioned the programs that utilities have through the Public Service Commission, where they uh, have committed funds that will be able to, to be to be capitalized and passed on to ratepayers. Um, so they are actively looking for partnerships. So it kind of touches on the, the last question about how do you even connect with a utility? And, and Kira, it's great to hear that you're meeting weekly. I think that's a a huge step in building that partnership. But they're actively looking for projects. Uh, in scenarios exactly like th this question here. And uh, so I think there's some really good funding and, and grant programs uh, available for them. As far I, uh, as working with the, sorry. Ahead. I was just gonna go say, ahead. as far as working with the utility, you know, I, I think you have to start at the top and um, get your, if, if your mayor, and I'm sure most, everybody here is mayor is um, engaged in this work or your council. And so getting them to talk to, you know, the top and then that from there, you can start. We had a memorandum of understanding between us and Duke Energy. And so, but it's a huge, huge organization. <laughs> and there's lots of people in it that don't know what the others are doing. They're like, oh, you're doing that with, with us. And, you know, and you're like, uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. am, you know, so kind of organizing all that would be an improvement, I guess. Great, and I want to leave time for the four of you to kind of jump in with any questions or responses to what you've heard. I wanted to just kind of um, echo in on diversification. Um, regarding, you know, electric vehicle charging infrastructure in general. I do think we are assessing that, right? So we do have this one program with BGE EV Smart program, but I do think that diversification and um, the, the charges that we offer in general, you know, I think that that's so important um, because it also creates a competitive advantage, right? Um, and not even, you know, not even say, you know, it, it, it has a pro. The pros are that you know, if somebody, if a company is not responding, you know, uh, performing appropriately, right? With like uptime or, um, or just not fouling stuff with the city, you know? Um, then it's it not only in the memorandum of understanding, you know, they're not complying with those terms, but you know, it just kind of creates more more competitive to encourage reliability. And so, if there's any other cities that are on here that they're thinking about just sticking with one company, I I know that the Baltimore we're not going in that route. I do think that diversification and not just the chargers, but even the type of chargers. Like I know we're also looking at solar panel chargers. We are also considering. Um, lamp post chargers. And I'm happy that, to hear that you guys are, um, you guys talked about it because I didn't even think about level one chargers, but I am going to bring that back to group um, because we have row home. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. 
That's great. All, all I would say is um, you've got some some fantastic UK companies uh, represented here. Um, we've got some great experience. Um, reach out to us, and, and I think that um, uh, hopefully will be reflected by uh, all of the speakers here. That um, you, you know, I think in in many ways the learnings that we've had with some of the cities and some of the rollouts. Um, we can we can talk and i'm always i'm always happy to uh, to, to talk and uh, impart any knowledge so do reach out to us um i'm sure that we'll be able to uh, to support you in what looks like a really exciting uh, growth growth in your cities thanks so much for that doug that was a perfect transition sadly we're at the end of our two hours um but I just wanna thank this group, Steve and Doug and Kieran Heather so, so much for your insights. Um, and I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Johan who will close us out. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And thank you ladies and gentlemen for um, a real informed discussion over the last couple of hours. I really wanna thank the, um, the folks from, from Dallas, from Phoenix, from Charlotte, from, from Baltimore. Um, you know, really appreciate you spending time today, sharing your experiences and, uh, and helping educate us in terms of what's worked and what, what hasn't worked as well uh, at your cities when it comes to EV charging infrastructure. Then in the same token, really thank the, um, the UK companies and organizations for, participate, for participate, participating today. City EV, Connected Curb, Wood, Arab, and then the Energy Systems Catapult and the RRA. I really think you know we, we are now a lot better informed in terms of uh, the challenges and, and and I think more importantly the solutions that um, that we have an offer to um, to really address um, the the sort of the, the equity balance when it comes to the rollout of EV charging infrastructure and and I think this is now a good sort of launch pad or foundation to um, for, for further collaboration and cooperation between the UK and the US when it comes to um, to this topic. Um, lastly, we will be sharing the, um, the slides to, to everybody, um, and there will also be the Electrification Coalition. They're going to be capturing some of the key uh, takeaways from today's uh, session, which we'll share with you probably the next week or so, so um, you'll be able to reference that going back. Um, and then finally, I really encourage everybody to, um, to, to stay connected if you've got questions, um, you know, with the with the cities, with the with the UK companies, please reach out to them. Um, reach out to myself, and then I can help you put in touch with um, with those companies, and also with um, some of my colleagues working at the other British consulates in the um, in the US. We've got folks from Los Angeles, uh, from uh, New York, from uh, Miami, um, and also from Chicago. Um, that now is um, you know eager to work with uh, with the cities in those regions. To, to see how we can now forge further collaboration when it comes to sharing of best practices and, and, the, and expertise in the, um, the deployment of, of EV charging. So without further ado, I think we're on right, well, almost at the top of the hour. So um, thank you all everybody for your participation and uh, look forward to, uh, to, the, to, to the momentum of today continuing in um, inside discussions and conversations going forward. So thank you again for everybody. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Johan. Very Johan, good. Sarah. Thanks for hosting. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Thank Thanks, you so Sarah, much. Everybody. For